Fascinating reveal on what Mitt Romney thinks about the Ukraine war and what it could potentially mean for the United States. We're going to go through that uh, as well as some other updates. Let's first hit some of the other updates just to get them out of the way. Uh, Mr. Olaf Scholz, the Chancellor of Germany, has ruled out the idea of sending jets to Ukraine at this point. But I want to be very, very clear here. Even though Germany is ruling out the idea of sending jets to Ukraine. And even though Poland and, and uh, the Netherlands are super excited to start providing more military equipment to Ukraine, uh, Germany wants to make it clear that right now they're just focused on tanks, that it is unfair and undermines trust in government to start speculating on jets when right now we need to deliver tanks which means we are sending Ukrainians to uh, fields in the United Kingdom to start learning how to operate tanks, which could take five to six weeks of not just mechanical training, but also battlefield tactic training. And uh, it is way too soon to start talking about the idea of ever sending jets to Ukraine. That is what Olaf Scholz suggests. And this is in response to the deputy foreign minister of Ukraine suggesting that the Eurozone should create a fighter jet coalition and not just supply fighter jets to Ukraine, but also HDW-212 Alpha submarines. So that way Ukraine can finally kick Russia out of the Black Sea. Yes, as Ukraine is now getting battle tanks, they are now not just asking for jets, but they're asking for massive submarines. And a lot of folks would say, hey, this is never going to happen. They're never going to get jets. They're never going to get submarines. But let's, uh, let's look at history here for a moment. When Russia first invaded Ukraine, Germany said they would start uh, helping Ukraine immediately. And you know what Germany sent Ukraine? They sent helmets, boots, and bulletproof vests. Then we moved on to working with the United States and sending javelins and Patriot uh, missile uh, uh, battalions or batteries uh, and, uh, and, and, and HIMARS rocket batteries. So we went from helmets to rockets and, uh, you know, javelins and stingers, anti-tank and anti-aircraft missiles. Now we evolved to sending armored personnel carriers. And within about a week to two weeks of sending armored personnel carriers for reconnaissance, we are sending battle tanks. So I believe it's only a matter of time before the world flip-flops and sends jets to Ukraine. Now, it's also worth noting that Joe Biden back in 2013, or in, in 2022, uh, it was March of 2022, so roughly a year ago, suggested, make no mistakes, sending battle tanks to Ukraine would be World War III. Make no mistake of that, said Joe Biden. Now we're sending battle tanks to Ukraine, and there's no more talk about this being World War III. So it does raise the specter that maybe, just maybe, we could end up sending fighter jets uh, to Ukraine because that's sort of the slippery slope that uh, the world economy has gone on. Now, so far, there are many arguments to suggest that, hey, maybe this is a good thing because really what we're doing is we're fighting a proxy war with Russia and we're weakening another nuclear power. In fact, that's roughly what Mr. Mitt Romney has to say, but I think it's best to listen to Mitt Romney say that himself. So let's go ahead and react to what Mitt Romney wants to tell us about his thoughts on the Russia-Ukraine war. Another reason that we uh, have interest in what's going on there, and that is because there's a nation, Russia, which is a geopolitical adversary. We're not at war with Russia, but they're an opponent. They actually have 1,500 nuclear warheads aimed at us. And we are, by virtue of supporting Ukraine in this, uh, this war, depleting and diminishing the Russian military, which is aiming its weapons at us. So this is a good thing for our national security. And by the way, Russia is also China's only real ally. And so if we're concerned about China, weakening Russia is a very good thing. Now that is a remarkable set of, dare I say, 
transparency of probably what's really going on in the backroom discussions of politicians in the United States. Consider, for example, the CHIPS Act ban on advanced manufacturing equipment and chip sales from going to China. The United States is very nervous about China. And Mitt Romney here tells us that China is basically Russia's largest ally. And China, Xi Jinping, has pretty much only gone as far as passively suggesting that Russia is just sort of exerting their regional dominance. In no means has China endorsed what's happening in Ukraine, and so they've gotten a lot less support than Russia probably expected from China. And China's doing a really good job of trying to respect the international sanctions that the United States has placed on Russia, uh, to the extent that at least we're publicly aware, to make it seem like China, on, in terms of the world stage, is cooperating with the United States, right? That's at least what President Xi Jinping of China is, is uh, establishing China's posture as. Mitt Romney here suggests, look, if Russia is one of China's strongest allies, then by weakening Russia, we're also weakening China, which we have the CHIPS Act, which weaken, is weakening China. We've got tariffs on a lot of their products and equipment. Uh, we've got, uh, including tires, it's crazy. Uh, but we've also uh, got an incentive to make sure that countries like uh, our allies, South Korea, Japan, uh, Taiwan, are protected. Uh, the United States has multiple times uh, made it very clear that in the event of an attack on Taiwan, the United States would stand ready to help and defend Taiwan. That is a very clear assault on sort of uh, Chinese perspectives of their regional dominance. The United States wants to have regional dominance there as a way of sort of preventing Taiwan from being invaded just by talking about it, but also by ensuring they have uh, adequate access to trade in the region. Again, via Taiwan Semiconductors, the country of Taiwan, uh, you've got Singapore, Malaysia, the Philippines, uh, you know, was, uh, trade routes to India. Uh, you, you've, you've got a lot of reason uh, to be exposed to China uh, or, or the, the Asia Pacific region and to, uh, to potentially limit uh, China's ability to uh, remove the United States from the region there. So Mitt Romney may, is basically making the argument that, hey, like, you know, and I, I might be taking this a step too far, but it's basically saying, hey, you know what? The longer the war goes on in Ukraine, the better it is for us and our trade interests and our economic interests in Asia. Now, that sounds terrible because it's basically saying, hey, you know, the longer the war goes on against Russia, the more people die, but that's okay because it makes the United States money. But from a realistic point of view, that potentially could be exactly what's going on, is the longer Ukraine fights Russia, and this might be why there's not like, let's give Ukraine everything up front, it's like, let's trickle stuff out to them. The longer this goes on, the weaker, in theory, Russia gets. Now, of course, Russia wouldn't tell you that things are getting weaker for them. In fact, Russia instead, apparently, according to Boris Johnson, threatened to blow up Boris Johnson in a missile strike. In a BBC interview that just aired, Boris Johnson said uh, Vladimir Putin got on the phone with him, uh, and uh, as uh, as uh, this was before uh, Russia's invasion into Ukraine, uh, Boris Johnson apparently was trying to negotiate with Vladimir Putin and, and basically get him not to invade Ukraine. Vladimir Putin apparently, according to Boris Johnson, uh, the Kremlin is full on denying this, calling this a lie. But according to Boris Johnson. Vladimir Putin basically said, hey, well, it wouldn't take much for a, a quick missile to uh, do some harm to you. It would only take a quick minute. Something like that. My accent's obviously really terrible. But, uh, you know, that's pretty blunt. That's <laughs> a pretty blunt threat. Uh, and uh, at the same time, as uh, Putin likes to sort of wave his saber, what do we also see is we see uh, Russia now implementing uh, new textbook policies that require that new textbooks for children in Russia be taught about the strategic operation that's going on in Ukraine and basically write history their way. 
and they'll have a council that's created to make sure that schools are cooperating with the new textbook requirements. Kind of wild. Now, uh, again, Joe Biden and Olaf Scholz right now are suggesting there's no way we are talking about sending jets to Ukraine, though we expect it's very likely for there to be a substantial flip-flop on that, especially since now the Associated Press is reporting that an advisor to Zelensky, quote, or suggest, quote, fast track talks are taking place for jets. Wow, that's pretty fascinating. <laughs> so uh, wouldn't be surprised to see uh, jets uh, getting sent over to uh, um, uh, Ukraine pretty soon here, uh, especially since at this point, you know, Putin has certainly given very few indications of ending the war. And clearly, as Mitt Romney mentioned he uh, here, the more we weaken Russia, not only is that good for us economically in uh, the Asia Pacific region, but it also weakens a nuclear adversary who, in the words of Mitt Romney, has 1,500 uh, warheads aimed at us. Uh, in addition to that, you, you don't yet have sort of an, a, a large-scale uprising against the war in, uh, in within Russia. That is, the people within Russia are, are, are not really trying to overthrow their government for anger around this war. Now, of course, they're being peppered with uh, content that is, uh, that is clearly very biased. Uh, of course, we probably are also getting content uh, and, and perspectives that are very uh, biased uh, to the opposite direction. But, uh, well, <laughs> you know what? We, uh, we are going to see how all of this evolves. At the same time, though, Japan, according to a Bloomberg piece, is uh, rearming their own country at a dramatic scale. So there is also the concern that all of this escalation is basically building a world tinderbox. And that at some point in the future, you could see, as we've seen from warnings from uh, retired generals and existing generals, we could have a real conflict with China in the future if, let's say, China invades Taiwan. You could have conflicts uh, continue in the Middle East. At the same time, you could have conflicts that have been rumored between Turkey and, uh, and, and for example, Greece. Uh, which uh, w would, would not be good. <laughs> there, are, there are so many potential things uh, that could go wrong. Uh, and I think uh, renuclearizing and rearming the world uh, should create some more fear uh, than optimism uh, for the direction we're heading in. Here, for example, is a Bloomberg piece here, uh, and, and it just sort of reiterates this part about Japan. Among the simple historic lessons being neglected is that governments everywhere are prone to grow more reckless as military escalation begins to seem the only route to peace. The leaders of Japan, another militaristic terror of the 20th century, are rearming their country on a dramatic scale, even as the cost of inflating its already extraordinary, or even at the cost of already inflating its extraordinary fiscal deficit. So in other words, the more countries arm uh, and the more countries get better and stronger weapons and new weapons because they've given Ukraine their older weapons, uh, the more... Uh, likely it is we see more military escalation throughout the world.